once again, I want to say thank you for joining this session and uh, a bit on how we will run this session. Today is an interactive session. Uh, so we're going to um, take three discussants and they will be talking on very specific topics. We have with us today, engineer Elda Ubon Nelson. I'm the one that has added uh, all those titles to him. He's a very humble man who doesn't uh, like title. <laughs> engineer Nelson was the president of the student fellowship that I attended in the University of Benin. So we have gone way back. So number two talk will follow up will be um, Mrs. Comfort Akpavio. And by the way, she's joining us from South Africa. And she will be talking about the key lessons that she has garnered from the topic so far. We've been, she has been part and parcel of the discussion, the teaching on the pathway to eternal life teaching. So the question is, what would you say about who is a Christian? Who is a Christian? She will discuss that. And then the third will be taken by my beloved wife, the Connors Gloria Dan Abia. And she will be looking at walk and walk, walk and walk in the Holy Spirit. What are the key steps? So this is what we have for us today. So on this note, we want to take the opening prayer and then we will hand over to Engineer Nelson right away. Let's take the prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you for gathering us together again this morning. We appreciate you. We glorify you. We honor you. You are our God and we are your children. And we are grateful to you for that. Let your name be exalted in the name of Jesus. Yes. Father, we ask this morning that you will be here with us. We can do nothing on our own. But Lord, we ask that you will help us. Holy Spirit, our helper, please come and help us. Lead us today. Guide us through all the sessions. And let Jesus alone be glorified. And let there be blessings for all the participants here, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. So over to you, Elder Nelson. I want to appreciate for the grace upon his life to the vision. Pity in his life is um, unmatch, unmatchable. I want to appreciate God for his life. May the Lord continue to bless him, bless his family, and cause him to have a very close program all through in his name. And the key words for our portion is growth. I mean, our growth and victorious Christian. After giving one's life to us, it is very important for one to grow. And we are talking about spiritual growth. Separate time for fellowshipping, for us daily talk with Jesus. So when one gives his life to Christ, he has to separate time for fellowshipping, to contemplate, to have his life planned. To seek God's face. Now, six tips for great quiet time. First tip is talk. Ever before you open your Bible, to, to, you have to pray like David of old. Psalm 1, verse 18. Say, open my eyes, O Lord, that I might behold wondrous things, Lord. Talk to God and ask him to behold wondrous things out of his law, which the Bible, which is the word of God. Now the second T is time. Choose a time that you know that you will not be in a, a time that nobody will take. So you choose a time that is suitable for you to meditate, to start thirty. the type. What do I mean by type? Choose the type Bible study. 
We want to take a deep story of, of prayer. It can be on faith. It can be on marriage. Any subject at all. So just choose the type that you want to, to do. It can be topical. Then the second one can be, you know, choose in the scripture. Can be can choose Jesus, John, can choose they choose all kinds of job. Want to start, you choose a character, and after one, you get to another to study. You can also say you want to do a book study. Can take the book of Genesis, John, can take the book of Psalms and do a detailed study and until you are done. Then the fourth is what I call tools. Tools. Get good tools. What are number one? A body Bible is a tool. You must have it. In those that I remember, one Bible I bought, I bought was a reverence Bible, very powerful. Uh, as I'm reading verse, it takes another one. Even up to me, I have a series of Bibles that I make references to. And it, it has helped me a lot growing over the years. So get a good you no know, study Bible. What is the second tool? Uh, a, a, Get a good Bible dictionary that will help you to check what you know, the, it may be a meaning of a word or a phrase. All those are things that will take you deeper into meanings of words of the Bible, meanings of all of that and the things, the, the way they were put down in the scriptures. You must have a very good translation. You know the Bible originally was written from I mean, uh, uh, Greek. So for you to have understanding, you may need, you know, a kind of a transition that will take you deeper into the words. The words are yeah, it was not in, in meaning on the surface. There's some detailed uh, meaning that you may need to as you get a good translation. You know, you, you go deep into it. Now, today, all all of these are available online. On this mission, they are all available online. Then finally, the sixth T, I want to form. I want to know that the quiet time, the essence of relationship with God is for transfer. Romans chapter 2, translation. Our heart needs to be transformed. Go from glory to glory glory you get to us as is stated in the book of second Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 this is expected Transform, transformation of our lives is expected so but in all of this there are questions that you must answer and the key questions you must be asking yourself and then ought to be uh, that you might may be answering all through the time of quiet times are number one as i am meeting with god as i'm reading as i'm studying is there any command for me to obey Number two, is there any act in me that will need change or I need to adopt? Is there a sin to avoid? Is there an example for me to follow in this study that I'm doing? So, is there an example for me to follow? And then you need to belong to a church, a Bible-believing church. Believing church, you need to make a friend with this with the shepherd you need a shepherd you need a, a, a you know a, a, a Jews. maybe you need prayers you need to go to him you have to make your pastor your friends god bless god bless you thank you thank you elder Hello, nelson sir. thank yeah. you very much that was so so rich so powerful Thank you, um, thank, thank you, you. The 60s, the 60s. Number one, Bless top. Number two, time. Number three, type. Number four, tools. Number five, translation. Number six, transformation. And then the four critical questions command to obey, attitude to change, sin to avoid, example to follow. This definitely will make a Christian to grow. God bless you, sir. So now we take the talk by Mrs. Comfort 
a Fabio. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me. My name is Mrs. Comfort Obon Akwabiu. Currently, I manage our clinics and also other businesses. We live here in South Africa with myself, my wonderful husband, and my beautiful children. My brothers and my sisters, I will tell you, please thank the pastor, my brother, Pastor Godwin Danavia, for God to use him to fan the flame of God's Holy Spirit, the gift of God's Spirit in me into flame. Just like Second Timothy chapter 1, I think it's verse 6, fan into flame, rekindle. I think he has been able to do that for me. So help me thank him. Thank God also for my life. Who is a Christian? I started by saying that for you to solve problem, you must first know what your problem is. And for you to know what your problem is, it will mean you must ask question, find out. When you ask question prayerfully, you answer those questions, definitely God who is a hearer of prayer will hear your prayer. So when we answer that question prayerfully, humbly ask God to guide us, then we will know that the pathway to eternal life, which pastor is saying, is sure, is free, is simple, is clear. Not by our own power, not by our own authority, but by the power of God Almighty. So who really is a Christian? Following on what pastors has been saying, I think we can just summarize by saying that a Christian is a person that resembles or is like Jesus Christ. And we can also say a Christian is a person that reflects and reveals a full nature of Jesus Christ. And I will add that a Christian is a child of God. So is that possible? I think from my book on, on my own understanding, this is possible because the Bible said it, Jesus himself said it. See, I really love what Jesus said in Matthew um, the 12, 50. When they praised his mother and Jesus said, that the people that are his brothers are those doing the will of his father in heaven. So his brothers, his sisters are Christians who are doing the will of his father. So it therefore means when we prayerfully answer that question, we will be on the path to having eternal life. And we cannot do this without knowing who Jesus Christ is. So who is Jesus Christ? From the Bible, we know the angels confirm who Jesus Christ is, which we can find at Luke chapter one, verse 35. The angels said, the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Ones will come upon Mary. And the child that will be born will be called the holy, will be called holy, the son of God. Very clear, very simple, very straightforward. The son of God. Another um, authoritative source is the disciple. When Jesus was talking with his disciple, that we all find at uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 to 17. Jesus asked them, 
who do people think I am? Some said, Elijah, John the Baptist, Jeremiah. Jesus, whom do you think I am? The disciples said, Peter, Simon Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus didn't take it lightly. He knew that answer did not just come. He said, it is not flesh and blood that reveal it to you. It is the Father in heaven. So we see how serious it is to know who Jesus is, the Son of God. It is only when the Spirit of God revealed to you or that you will know. Another source, too, that we should know is the Father himself. During Jesus' baptism and also during his transformation, Transfiguration, sorry. There, the Holy Spirit came down to bear witness. A voice also came from heaven. This is my son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. So, it is also very clear. We can see the angel confirmed who Jesus is, the son of God. Uh, the disciple God himself and Jesus himself, when he was talking, he said, I am from the Father, my Father. He referred to God as his Father. And in fact, the Jews who believe they have the right because they were from Abraham knew the graffiti, the intensity of what Jesus was saying. So for them to know that there was true son of God who has identified himself, they know what it means. As the son of God, Jesus ha has the legal rights, the authority, the power, because he was born by the Holy Spirit. That authority, God gave it to him. For over all God creation, all of God creation, Jesus, as the Son of God, has that legal right, both in heaven and on earth. I think that uh, scripture is always very easy and straightforward. Matthew 28, the last verse, where Jesus said, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Also in Philippians, they said, God gave Jesus authority, he exalted him. And we have seen that Jesus demonstrated this authority while on earth, and none were confused that he was a son of God. The same thing with his disciples. So if we are a Christian, somebody that resembles Jesus Christ, we have this authority. We have this same right. We have this same power, not of our own, but like uh, John chapter one, verse 12 and 13. They say, Jesus is looking. Anyone that believes in Jesus, Jesus will make them the children of God. So Jesus is looking for his brothers, his sisters, so that they can have God's Holy Spirit and yeah. be like Jesus Christ. So we can see the pathway to everlasting life or to eternal life is like Jesus said, or John 3, 16 says, God sent Jesus Christ so that whoever believes in him will not be destroyed but will have eternal life. So when we believe in Jesus Christ, we repent from our sins. We ask God for God's Holy Spirit. As he, the Bible says, God gave Jesus Christ spirit without limits. God can give us that spirit. And we live, we become the sons and daughters of God that Jesus came to reconcile to his father. And we live that life as a Christian, as Jesus lived, those 
and that is a Christian. And when you do this, eternal life is certain and sure for you. Thank you, my brothers. Thank you, my sisters. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Comfort Ubon Akpavio for that uh, presentation. Thank you. God bless you. Uh, because of time, I think we'll just take the third speaker, my beloved wife, Deaconess Gloria Godwin Dan Abia, uh, who will be speaking on work and work in the Holy Spirit. All right. Good morning, everybody. So I'll be taking the question this morning. It talks about how does one walk and walk in the Holy Spirit? Walk in the Holy Spirit. What are the steps? Praise the Lord. Um, before we, we, we just go into this direct, I want to quickly introduce the Holy Spirit to us. Because why do we need the Holy Spirit in the first place? We know he's the third person in the Trinity, in the Godhead. He's the spirit of the Most High God. He's our support system as Christians and as children of God. He's actually our lifeline. That's the way I want to put it. If we can't do anything without him. Amen? We can't do anything without the Holy Spirit. And we know that he's our helper, he's our comforter, he's our teacher and all of that. We'll see that in John 14, 26. So, but why is it so important that we walk in the Holy Spirit? The truth of the matter is that this is the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And as children of God, we'll be shortchanging ourselves if we do not have the Holy Spirit. So we must befriend the Holy Spirit. If you look at the Bible in the book of John 14, 18, because of time, we won't be, you can just take note of those scriptures. You can look at them later. Sorry, let's look at John 16, 7. Jesus himself told his disciples, and we are also his disciples today. So it also applies to us. He says that it is expedient that I live so that the Holy Spirit can come. It's expedient for us as children of God for Jesus to live so that he can send the comforter who is the Holy Spirit. Because he also said in John 14, 18, he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you as I will come to you. Amen. He says, I come to you. That tells us how important it is for us to have the Holy Spirit. As Christians and discussing, talking about the topic, who is a Christian? But without the Holy Spirit, we cannot really function as Christians. The Holy Spirit, as I said, is our support system. That's our lifeline. If we unplug ourselves from him, we will just be lifeless as Christians. Jesus also said it here. He said, he will not leave us as orphans. For us to have God, our Father, and be living as orphans, it is it's a misnomer. It's an abnormal thing. So we must have the Holy Spirit. So let's quickly look at the steps that we, we can take to have the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord to, to walk and um, walk in the Holy Spirit. I'm going to be interchanging those words because in this situation, they're almost the work of the Father in the Holy Spirit because he has already promised us that greater works we will do than him. Amen. So the first step in walking in the Holy Spirit, Hebrews 11, 6 says that whoever comes to God must believe that he is. So you must believe that he exists in the first place. And he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. So we must believe that the Holy Spirit exists. We must believe that he is God. That's the first step. After that, the, 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 the Father for his spirits. And we have been told in the previous teachings that we'll see that God himself is more eager to give us his spirit. If you look at Luke eleven thirteen, 13, we can take note of that and read it later. It says that God himself is more willing to give us his spirit. So we as children of God, we must ask God for his spirit, who is the Holy Spirit, and be intentional. Please, I want to emphasize this point. Be intentional in your accent. Don't just ask it as a casual accent. Ask intentionally. Believe that he is going to hear you. And you, since you know that he's more than willing to give you the spirit, he will give it to you. And in faith, receive that spirit. Praise the Lord. So we were told in the previous teachings that the, the model B, 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 R, R, B, L, the believe, the repent, the receive, become and live. 
So we'll see that that your model applies to some extent to some of these steps. So the first step is belief. You'll see that in the belief. The second step is asking, which I also tie down to receiving. Because when you ask and you know that he's more than willing, you receive it in faith and know that he has given you the spirits. Amen. If you look at John 1, 12, also he says that as many that are led by the spirit are the sons of God. So as Christians, as children of God, if we ask in faith and believe and receive the Holy Spirit, we will be led by him. So that's a step, a way of walking and walking in the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. We also see that if we put our faith into action, this has to do with the living, the becoming and the living in that model. You, you have become a child of God as you are led by the Spirit of God. So you have to start living in that spirit. It's a new way of life. And like I said earlier, he's our support system. He's our, he's, he's our strength. He's our source of energy. Without the Holy Spirit, we can do nothing. All the works that we see Jesus did, he did it by the Spirit of God. And now that Jesus has gone to be with the Father, he has sent us his Spirit. And we will see that what struck, if, if, if we look at this very critically, we will see that the, the, the nature of God, the omnipotent nature of God has been displayed from the time of old. That's omnipotent, meaning the power of God. Omniscience also, the all-knowing God, that's omniscience nature. But we we'll see that it is in this dispensation of the Holy Spirit that the omnipresent nature of God is being revealed. He is here at every time as we have all joined from our respective homes, locations, and the rest. The Holy Spirit is here. He makes it possible for all of us to be with him. He makes it possible for him to be with all of us at the same time. When Jesus was here on earth, you could see that he could only be at one place at one time even though he was he's the omniscient God, all-knowing, the omnipotent God, all-powerful. But the Holy Spirit now, in this dispensation, makes the omnipresent nature of God manifest to us. So he can be here at every single time. He can be with you also where you are right now. Praise the Lord. So we must not shortchange ourselves. We must befriend the Holy Spirit so that he can be with us at every single point in time. And we must maintain the connection. The next point I want us to, to, to look at is that we must maintain the, the, the connection through frequent communication with the Holy Spirit. We can see when network issues arise, there is a break in our communication, break in transmission. But when we maintain that constant fellowship with the Holy Spirit, there's no break, break, breakage in our network, there's no breakage in our transmission with him. Praise the Lord. So we, we can do that by praying as, as mentioned by the earlier speakers, we pray to him, be conscious that he's with you, speak to him as we are speaking to each other now, speak to him and listen for the instructions that he has to give so that you can maintain that connection and always have signals from him. As he gives us instructions, we'll be able to obey them, work with him and allow our lives to be victorious. So I'll just conclude by saying, don't live as orphans. Don't live comfortless as people that don't have comfort. The Holy Spirit has been given to us. So take it, start to work with him and utilize all that he has for us in Jesus' name. God bless us as we do so. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, excellent, clear. Don't live as orphans. Christians, you have been given the Holy Spirit. The omnipresence nature of God is with us. Don't leave us orphans. Thank you for that powerful presentation. Okay, um, the floor is open for questions, please. Your question. Can you be distracted as a Christian? Can you be a Christian and not be saved? Can a Christian wander away? So let's roll all this up together and say what will make a Christian not to make it to eternity in, with Christ. Haven't received it. Then there was a comment around um, who is a Christian and someone said rather um, he would put it as who is a good Christian. I think uh, Mrs. Comfort Uborakwavio addressed that already in her talk when she said there can't be a good Christian, a very good Christian, 
a fake Christian. Um, it, it is like when Christianity started, as we see in Acts chapter 11, in Antioch, Acts chapter 11, verse 26, it was not the people who call themselves Christian, it was the lie they lived. So um, a Christian or Christianity is actually um, the existential uh, move of God that ought to be all over the world. So there is not supposed to be a good and a bad Christian, <laughs> a real and a fake Christian. There is only one Christian. It is one who has received the transformation by the Holy Spirit because that person has believed in God and Jesus Christ and his or her sins have been forgiven and the person has changed. So if you change by the Holy Spirit as also has been presented, you are a Christian and at the end of the day, Jesus said, now the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, he is none of his. So it is that Holy Spirit that makes you, makes me, makes anyone a Christian. But of course, there is the religious um, Christianity. So that early move uh, from Antioch, as I mentioned, had grown and evolved into a religion. And that's why some people begin to think about this idea of good Christian or bad Christian. A Christian ought to be good, ought to be like Christ, a transformed life. And so there is one Christian, there is one Christianity, but there is the religion of Christianity. And this is why God is raising me up, raising you up, raising us up to reach the world again and let the world know the truth of who a Christian is rather than just the religion. There is a place of the religious practice, that's okay, but the life, eternal life is what we're talking about here. So I hope that I put paid to that. Now the key question, can a Christian fall? Let's put it that way simply. Let's address that. It's a very important question. Can a Christian fall away from the grace, the mercy of God? Yes, indeed. Um, let's start from there. So when we are talking about a Christian, that's why it was important for us to emphasize who a Christian is. We're talking about a Christian. We're not talking about good Christian, bad Christian, all those qualifications. We're talking about somebody who has received the spirit of God and has experienced the transforming power of God. If that is the person we are talking about, let me start by saying that it is a very difficult thing to happen. Very, very difficult. The reason for that is that there is no power in heaven and on earth that can take you out of the hand of the Father. Jesus said so. In John chapter 27, if you have the book, you can open it and also read. There's a portion there in John chapter 27. Sorry, John chapter 10, verse 27. Uh, where Jesus said, my sheep, they hear my voice and they follow me. And that no, no, nothing. He said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. You can hear that. So that's Jesus' promise. And Jesus is serious about this. John chapter 10, verse 27. However, let's make clear what Jesus was talking about there. He said, they hear my voice and they follow me. The only person that can take himself or herself out of being a Christian is the person who became a Christian. 
So let's understand that. So when I hear people say, oh, sin, sin doesn't have enough power to take a Christian out of being a Christian. And you see that in the Bible. I'll read it quickly. The devil does not have enough power to take anybody who is a Christian out from being a Christian. Nothing at all can take you out. So you see, John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. It says that the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, they are of this world and they are not of the Father. So when an individual decides to ignore the Holy Spirit and go indulge in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, it is like a marriage. And you can see uh, that in Ephesians chapter 5 from verse 25. The Bible says that uh, husband love your wife as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might wash her and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word that he might deliver unto himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. So it is actually Jesus' duty to keep you, just like he said. It is Jesus' duty by the Holy Spirit to keep me, to keep us. But like I said, it is like a marriage relationship. So a Christian who ignores the Holy Spirit and indulges in the loss of the flesh, the loss of the eyes, and the pride of life will continually receive warning. The Holy Spirit will be prompting, asking. So it will get to a time where that such a person will take himself. You are the one who can take yourself out of Christ. But if you're willing to stay with Christ as a Christian, I tell you there is no power that can take you. So I'll just read a number of scriptures. You can write them down, please. Romans chapter 8, 34 to 39. 1 John 3, 6 to 10. I've already mentioned 1 John 2, verse 16. So I'll read these two scriptures quickly because of time. I'll just run through it, but you will get the message that I've already summarized. So first, uh, Romans chapter 8 from verse 34. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Christ is making intercession for you and me. So don't be afraid. Don't leave Jesus. You're the one to unplug yourself. As uh, this, uh, the last speaker also said, you have the Holy Ghost. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written? For your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. 37. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. God loves you. God doesn't want you to fall. Jesus has said no power can snatch you out of his hand. Let's focus on that. Except you refuse to follow him. You see, he said, my sheep, they hear my voice and I know and they follow me and no power can take them out of my hand. That's the condition. Except you refuse to follow Jesus, whom you have come to know as a Christian, whom I have come to know as a Christian. I continue verse 37 or verse 38 rather. For I am persuaded, hear this one. He said, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the scripture. So we look at 1 John chapter 3, and I will read from verse 6 to 10. Whoever abides in him does not sin. So this is the key, abiding. And we have been taught this morning how to abide, having our quiet time, following the 60s daily, and asking the four critical questions and taking 
the lesson from that and practicing it. I start again from verse 6. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous. He's a Christian just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. The works of the devil, the chief works of the devil is sin. And Jesus has destroyed that works of the devil. So if you have come to Christ and become a Christian, have received the spirit of God, no power can take you out except you refuse to abide and begin to indulge in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I continue to read verse 9. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. Again, he said, whoever has been born of God does not sin. This is the scripture. His seed remains in him. His seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. 10. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God nor is he who does not love his brother. Brothers and sisters, you can hear the scripture. So abide in Christ and no power can take you out. God bless you. Yeah. There's a question. Okay, please There's take the question. question. Read the question. Yeah. It says, um, when praying to the Holy Spirit, do we pray through the Holy Spirit to Yahweh or do we pray directly to the Holy Spirit? That's coming from um, Juanita. Okay, good. Good that you have asked that question. First, let me um, approach this question by telling us about, again, the love of God. So it's just like a little child, people are at different level of understanding. So when we make certain mistakes, God knows our heart and intent, and he deals with us according to that. So when some mistakes are made, it's not, uh, yeah, God, uh, oh, yeah, you've not asked directly. You have not used the right words. You have not used the right tenses, so God won't answer. It doesn't work that way. So let's remember that. Having said that, let me make a very categorical statement. Because this is about Christians and we have to get things right. We don't pray to the Holy Spirit. I'm sure some people will be shocked hearing this. We don't pray to the Holy Spirit. Get this right. It is not in the entire scripture. We only pray to God in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the only order and model of prayer. When we speak in tongues, we are actually asking the Holy Spirit to pray through us. He helps us to pray. So we don't pray to the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ taught it very simply and clear. He said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And then in another place, he said, if you ask the Father, or if you ask anything in my name, the Father will give it to you. So it's always about the Father and Jesus Christ. You can go to the book of Revelation and study a bit more. I'll refer you, I really ask you to go do that. So you can understand the setting on earth and the setting in heaven. So in Revelation chapter uh, 5, verse 9, the Bible says, you are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred and people and nation and tongue and have made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign in the earth. 
And the Bible says, after this, I saw all creatures in heaven on everywhere in the sea. And they say, worthy is the lamb. And they gave him worship. And they continued and said, blessing and glory and honor and power be to him who sits upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever. So the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ is given to us to enable us to the will of God. He has all the attributes of God, all the power, the nature of God in us. But we pray to God in the name of Jesus. Take time and study it a bit more so you can be more effective. However, like I said, that's why I made that first statement. Our God is love. So uh, just like you will trick your little child when they don't communicate very well, you try and help and follow and get them. Yeah, then you understand what they're doing. And of course, God already knows everything, knows our heart. So thank you for that question. Okay, you've answered, does God have favorite sons and daughters? Last thank week. you, thank you, thank you. I really want to um, address that question. I have spent time and prepared the answer on our platform, the, our WhatsApp platform. So if you were not there to read that, um, okay, I would just read it to us. But I will only be able to summarize because I provided very comprehensive answer. So God does not have favorite sons and daughters. We are all sons and daughters of God. And the proof of this, uh, we'll look at it in three dimensions. The first is salvation. Ask yourself, is there a special salvation for anybody? The answer is no. There is no special salvation for anybody. We are all saved by G, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ, cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, we receive the same salvation, the same forgiveness of sin. There is nobody who has received more forgiveness of sin. The person's sin might be more in degree, but it is the same salvation we all receive. If you agree that salvation is the same, as the scriptures, they say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So it is for everybody. There is no difference to the Jews, to the Greek, to anybody. It's the same salvation through Jesus Christ. So if we settle that, that salvation is the same. The next question now is the Holy Spirit. Do we receive a different Holy Spirit? No, we receive the same Holy Spirit. So the same Holy Spirit, no special Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the same. So if we settle that as well, and as uh, the four other speakers were mentioned, you again can check the respective scriptures that refers to that. Acts chapter 10, verse 38, the example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then you go from that, Acts chapter 10, uh, the household of Cornelius, the spirit fell on them and they were Gentiles. Cornelius' household were Gentiles, the spirit fell on them. Peter said, who can stop us from baptizing them? Seeing that the spirit has fallen on them just like it fell on us. So, and in Acts chapter 2, you see the Holy Spirit fell on all those who were in the upper room. There was no one that had a special Holy Spirit. So we receive the same Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is one. So having settled issue of salvation, settled issue of the Holy Spirit, which is now the power, the enablement that we have received, then tell me where one becomes a favorite special child of God and specially anointed. No, that's not what it is. Now, where the difference comes is in the gifts your physical capability, your talent. God trains us up through different ways to use us in his assignment in different capacity. That's why the Bible says that we are one body but different members. But 
and every member has a function. So just like a father um, would have diff their children, they have different capabilities, they treat and relate with the father in different ways. But in his heart, a real father will not have a favor for one child and the other. But he may assign responsibilities to one child more than the other, knowing that child's capability, not that in his heart, this child is now special, favored, and the other ones are unfavored. If you are a son or a daughter, remember that is the difference. And we have said that only Christians, a Christian, one who has come to Jesus Christ and by that has received the Holy Spirit is qualified to be called a son or a daughter of God because it is only the Spirit of God through whom Jesus Christ was born in the flesh, the Son of God, is only through the Holy Spirit that we will come sons and daughters of God. So the father does not have a favorite special child. It is the ability that we have to apply the grace. So apply the grace of God that is available to you and live with that. I also have discussed the example of the talent so that I can close this. The talent, you remember the story in the Bible. Jesus made that illustration concerning the kingdom of God. He said, it's like a man who traveled in a, to a far distance and he gave talents to, uh, he gave the first person five talents, the second two talents, and the third one talent. And the one who had five talents traded and made five talents more. The second traded and made two talents more. When he returned, you remember, he rewarded the one who traded and made five talents more and the one who traded and made two talents more. So they all both made 100% by the gifts, using the gift that were given. Unfortunately, the one who had one talent, because of this mentality of thinking that the father has a favorite, didn't use his own. So what God expects us to do is use your gifts your ability and your talent because the spirit of God is with you. In fact, the weaker one is and relying on the Holy Spirit, the bigger the testimony will be. Praise the name of the Lord. So the one who had one talent didn't use and that was the judgment. Thank you for that question. I hope this clarifies. So the Holy Spirit has been given to us. Let's explode, live by faith and love. God bless you. How do I feel the Holy Spirit? I think you, you also talked on it on the first um, episode. How do okay. I feel the Holy Spirit? Okay, sometimes you feel dry. How do I stir up the Holy Spirit? Yeah. So as we said before, let's be sure it is not a sinful life. There are three moments, and there may be more, but let's touch on. There are three moments you may have that kind of experience. The first one is attack of the devil. Attack of the devil. You can be feeling dry. The devil just... There are people at times you pray in the night very well, entered your bed and slept. Then you woke up in the morning feeling tired, feeling dry, feeling uninspired. So that's one. The second, it's somebody who, as I talk about the loss of the flesh, the loss of the eyes and the pride of life. Is a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit, you are heading in the dangerous uh, territory, as we have said. And the Holy Spirit is warning you don't go that. Don't do this. Don't. Yeah. So there are those moments the Holy Spirit tries to get your attention. However, in those moments, you will actually feel the grief 
in your heart if you have the spirit of God rather than feeling dry. But let's see you paint that picture. Then the other moment is just the moment where you're just normal. You just feel normal. Nothing special. The first point, the one that I talked about before, know all the time that the Holy Spirit is with you, whether you feel him or you don't feel him. The Holy Spirit is not emotional. Even though when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will feel the inspiration. You will feel the excitement. You will feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit does not walk by emotion. The Holy Spirit walks by the principle of the word of God, the principle of faith. So when you have the Holy Spirit, be conscious that you have him, whether you feel him or you don't feel him. Then the second one, when it is those moments, ask yourself questions. Especially when you're trying to take decisions, critical decisions. And you feel, begin to ask yourself, are there decisions I'm trying to take and I have not consulted the Holy Spirit to guide me? When you have such moments, take time and pray. So how you stir up the Spirit is to pray. Ask the Holy Spirit, guide me, reveal things to me. And then it will come to your mind. And then the last point where it is a situation of sin, a situation of sin. You just repent of that sin. When the Holy Spirit convicts your heart, repent of that sin. In moments where you're just feeling ordinary, just like the moment that the devil attacked you, I said, no, you have the Holy Spirit. Just rebuke the devil. And in the moment where you just feel ordinary, again, no, you have the Holy Spirit. So don't stop doing anything that you would have done because you don't feel it. And in that moment, of course, worship God, speak in tongues, study the Bible, and pray. Those are the ways to stir up the Holy Spirit. But please don't say, I cannot pray for the sick because I didn't feel moved by the Holy Spirit. They just shall live by faith. And faith is believing God and his word and operating in that consciousness that you are a son, a daughter of God, you have been raised to the place of authority to do the things Jesus did here on earth and the things Jesus has commanded us to do now that he is seated at the right hand of God, having all power, authority, dominion over all creations of God. And he has said to us, I give you the authority in my name to do the things that I do. And it's still Jesus that is walking through us. So know that it is not you. You don't have the power of your own. So that's why you must move. Like I close this with a testimony. Yesterday, a brother just called me in the night and uh, I was in the middle of something and said, pray for my son. I said, put the phone on him. And he put the phone as we were praying on, we began to speak in tongues. I said to them, okay, you continue to put your hand on him and speak in tongues. And he is going to slip off. A child that was crying and screaming. Later on, I went and prayed more. And then I called them. When I called, he said the boy was sleeping. Glory be to Jesus. Thank you for that question. I think we, want, we have to draw the, it to a close here. Yeah? But please, if there is any follow-up question that somebody has, you can open your line and say it. My question is, some Christians genuinely cannot speak in tongues. When they are praying, what happens if they can't speak in tongues? God and still hears the prayers. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So we addressed this uh, two Sundays ago. And let me take you a bit to the scripture because you are very correct. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 
we were reading verses 30 and 31 when we addressed this question that you have received the holy spirit and the gifts the holy spirit helps you manifest in four dimensions the first transformation by the holy spirit is the fruit of the spirit which is the righteousness of god so that nature of righteousness is given to you by the spirit of god the fruit of the spirit galatians chapter 5 verses 22 to 24. the next of oh, next now still means sequential okay the second is the gifts of the spirit which is the power of god that is in you and in this first corinthians chapter 12 if you start reading from verse 8 you will see, say, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same spirit. It goes on the, all the way. Uh, in verse 10, it says, but to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But when you go to verse 30 and 31, verses 30 and 31, he says, do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gift, and yet I show you a more excellent way. So indeed you are right. There are some Christians that genuinely do not speak in tongues. And it is not because they cannot speak in tongues. It is because they are limited. You see, that's why we're teaching everyone to operate the dimension of the Spirit of God is all by faith. So I gave example of two people who joined a company and one said his mind and said, I'm going to climb to the top of this company. And I'm not telling story, I'm talking about what really happened. And the other one said, this company, a very well-paying company. This other one said, me, I will be focusing on utilizing the money they pay me to invest. I want to be rich before I get to my retirement age. And both achieved it. So the one who was focusing on putting money in investment, didn't go as high as the one who said he wants to become a chief executive in that company. But while he was investing, God helped him, his investments grew. So much so that where he has properties, I was telling the people, the chief executive will have to borrow money, take loan to buy a property in that place. The power of faith, focus and walk okay so that christian is not that he cannot speak in tongue but he is limited and he needs to do what paul said here paul here acknowledged that it is not all that speak in tongues it's not all who even manifest the gift of healing it is not because the spirit is not in them it is because the have a limitation that they need to train themselves up and overcome. And that's why he added verse 31, he said, but earnestly desire the best gifts. Because often I hear people quote this and they put it as though the, the spirit doesn't want you to speak in tongues. If you go to the Acts of Apostles and check, you will see that there was no time the Holy Spirit fell on the people and anybody was exempted. So we need to take this scripture. Yes, there is a limitation and train yourself up. Now back to the second part of your question. So while this person is limited in the area of speaking in tongues, which is the critical thing about your question, it does not mean the person doesn't have the Holy Spirit. Let's get that clear. So we explained this in the previous study. When you come to Jesus Christ, repent, you ask God to give you the Holy Spirit. 
Luke chapter 11, verses 11 to 13 makes it clear to us. You can note that and read it. Our Father in heaven is loving and is more than willing to give us the Holy Spirit. So when you ask him, have faith that you have received and you have been given. It is now you walking. That's why we talk about walking or walk and walk in the Holy Spirit. Okay. So it is that journey of walking. However, anybody who has received the Holy Spirit must, this one is must, experience a transformation. So there is nobody who will say, I received the Holy Spirit and his life has not been transformed. So in those four dimensions, there must be signs that something has changed in this person's life. I've talked about the uh, fruit of the Spirit to the area of righteousness. Because as you heard us read in 1 John chapter 3, 6 to 10, you see in verse 9, he said, He that is born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him. And he said, Anyone that sins is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. So, you may not speak in tongues, but you have received the Holy Spirit. So, in that moment, what do you do? That is your question. It is the consciousness of how the Spirit manifests in you and works through you that you need to be conscious of. Such moments, such a person, I would ask, tell you to just uh, meditate and sing and praise in the Holy Spirit. When I say sing and praise God in the Holy Spirit, I'm not talking about speaking in tongues, in songs. I'm talking about you really consciously knowing that you are releasing the conscious power of God that is in you as you're praising and as you're worshiping God. I, I like giving examples. I prayed for a lady about two weeks ago. I ministered the word of God to her and she gave her life to Jesus Christ. Having led her through the prayer of confession and forgiveness of sin, I laid hands on her and prayed that the Holy Spirit should fall upon her. And she began to feel the power of God and was responding and jacking and jacking them at a point. She opened her mouth and began to praise Jesus in such deep language that only the Spirit can give. And it was exactly what I prayed as I was laying hands on her that the Holy Spirit should fill her. I said, Holy Spirit, manifest yourself in her. Give her the enablement to speak in tongues and magnify Jesus. And she began to magnify Jesus in such deep understanding that you know it is only the Spirit of God can give this uh, message. For somebody who has just given her life to Jesus. He said, if I still remember that word, he said, Jesus, you who rule over the whole universe, receive praise. And it was in song she was ministering. I'm just so uh, emotional remembering that beauty because it was so beautiful for me to watch. She sang that song for a period of time and then changed to another song. I had removed my hand from her, but she continued in that moment for almost a space of uh, five to 10 minutes, just magnifying God. I actually left because I was doing something else and she continued on her own. I told my wife to just be with her and I went to do something else. Thank you for that question. Please, I hope that clarifies. So, worship God in that moment. Concentrate in the Spirit. Be conscious that you have the Spirit of God and the Spirit will guide you. I've had a testimony of somebody whom at that moment, he was just led to just be calling Jesus. 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 As he did that, the sick person that he was ministering to received power. Power entered that sick person and the person got healed. 
So, and finally, I would say, please desire speaking in tongues and continually get the ministration. Don't stop. Don't say, me, I can't speak in tongues. There is, is only a limitation. You can speak in tongues. All Christians can speak in tongues, but not all Christians speak in tongues. That's how I will close it. All Christians, which are people who have received the Holy Spirit, have the capability to speak in tongues. They have by the Spirit, but not all of them do speak in tongues because they are limited. So they need to get through that limitation. But while that limitation is there, they have the Spirit of God and they can manifest it just like I have talked about. And they should know how the Spirit works with them so they can stir up the spirit like we also talk about um, people who may sometimes feel dry and wondering ah the spirit is not in me it's not on me no the spirit is with you as long as you have not unplugged yourself like we read in that romans chapter 8 what can separate us from the love of god no power nothing jesus is more powerful than the devil, than the world, than sin, than anything. As long as you are ready to be married to Jesus, you don't tell him, Jesus, I am living. Like I said, it's like marriage. It will take the two parties to separate. So some people at times keep telling Jesus, I want to leave this marriage. I want to leave this marriage. That's their attitude. That's what they do. And Jesus is interceding, is holding on. The Spirit of God is helping, is leading. Uh, but it gets to that point where they unplug themselves. That's how it happens and leave. But as long as you come to Jesus and say, forgive me, sincerely, I want to stay. I want to continue in this marriage. I want to continue in this life. The seed of God that is in you, that is in me, will keep us till the end of this life and we will translate from this world and be in the presence of God and enjoy eternity with him at the resurrection. God bless you. Let's pray and close. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for teaching us your word. We thank you for the fellowship we have enjoyed today. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for teaching us, our counselor. We ask, fill us, Holy Spirit, renew us, quicken us. You are our divine help. Please help us. And as we are entering a new week, we ask that the power to do all that the Almighty God has kept for us to do in life, all the good desires and plans that we have, please give us that power that we may be able to execute the plans, the activities, the things that we have proposed to do in order to glorify God. Thank you, our Lord and our God. Heavenly Father, I pray specifically for those who have given their life to Jesus Christ, those who have repented, and are asking, Lord, come into my life. I ask that the blood of Jesus wash them, cleanse them. And I ask, Lord, that you fill them anew, fill them afresh with your Holy Spirit. I pray, Father God Almighty, that you shield all these, your children, from the evil that is going around in the world. And keep everyone safe, preserved, till your coming. Lord, I ask that whatever this your children have begun to do, whatever goals they have set to achieve this year, by your spirit, help them to achieve all of them. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, that you who have begun a good work in us, you will bring it to completion. Father, let everyone complete their good projects, good work that they have started in you this year. In the midst 
of the pandemic, Lord. You have spoken and said you will enlarge your own. I ask, Father, for great enlightenment upon these, your children. Surprise them, O oh God. That when they look at the end of this year, they will say, wow, in this year that looks so, so tough, it has been even my best year. Thank you, our Father and our God. Anyone that is sick, I command that sickness to get out in the name of Jesus. I declare everyone on this line by the stripes of Jesus Christ, you are healed. It is your right to be healed. The Bible says healing is the children's bread. And the Bible says he sent forth his word and his word healed them and delivered them from all their destruction. So whatever affliction, whatever sickness, pain in the stomach, movement around the body, I command it to cease in the name of Jesus. Be healed and God bless you. Father, receive all glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.